Ted, are you about ready to get started? We've got a few folks that may join us here in just a few minutes, but I'd like to go ahead and get started because I know that your presentation is packed with uh, information. Pretty much get started anytime. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Glad you guys could make it this afternoon. I know everyone is ex uh, extremely busy, um, but we appreciate you joining us. And um, if you have any questions, you know, put them in the chat box. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end of the presentations for some QA. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Ted Clifton. He's with Zero Energy Plans. Uh, Ted has been a builder and a designer for 45 years. Uh, this presentation that he's doing for us today, designing and building zero energy homes, um, is more of like a four hour or a full day of training, if not longer, that he has condensed for us um, in a jam packed one hour. So we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say, Ted. Let us know what you need. Okay, well, with that, I'll try to take over the screen here and hopefully it will work. Let me hit some OK buttons. And so is everybody seeing my screen at this point? I am not. OK. Is everybody else seeing him? OK. Not yet. Well, let me go back to your screen again and hit share screen again. OK, there we go. Looks like it. Uh, how about now? There you go. Okay. And, and this is the on. format that we want to see it in. We, we see that you have your deck to the left, but this is good for you from your standpoint. So yeah, this is I'm, good. I'm gonna make it a little wider. Maybe it'll get bigger. There you go. Uh, yeah, my chat has disappeared. So Selena, if you can let me know when we have questions in chat, then uh, I can take a break either during a slide or, or between slides. Sounds good. Okay, well, with that, welcome everybody. Uh, like Selena said, this is a really an eight hour class that I've condensed down. I did it at IBS in 2014 in a one hour format and took about an hour and 10 minutes to actually slam through it as fast as I could with a room with 175 people in it. Uh, I am used to doing it uh, in person. And so this will be a little different because I don't get the same kind of feedback from people if I'm going too fast or too slow, but uh, hopefully it'll work. So uh, here we go. Uh, our learning objectives here to understand what these 12 distinctive strategies for designing and building zero energy plans are, or zero energy homes, and uh, give you an understanding of the difference between our traditional HVAC systems, heating, venting, air conditioning, and what indoor air quality systems really are about, because they're two separate functions. I'd really like them to take the V out of HVAC and just have it HAC and then V by people who understand that part of it. So you'll discover some new ways of thinking about many of the different things that we're doing in the house, not just the big ones, but there's lots of little energy loads that can be considered. And when you're really trying to get to zero or get down below zero where we typically are, where we're powering your car with your house, um, you need to do a lot of things to get it right. So we're going to show you how to be cost effective about doing these things. And hopefully by the time we're done, you'll have a pretty good idea how to build tomorrow's house today. I always like to start with a little bit of, of uh, background from William McDonough. He's a world renowned architect, often uh, seen as the, the father of green building. But uh, one of his comments that I always love is regulation is an indicator of design failure. And from that, I say, wow, you know, if, if we've been doing it right from the first place, would we even have a building code? If, if no house had ever fallen down or ever had any moisture issues or anything else, would we even have a building code? So um, one of the things that uh, he's always said is being less bad is not being good. It's just less bad. It's still bad. So. Let's strive for good. And you know, trashing the planet is not our intention as a species. So if we get the design right, uh, we can do so much more with what we have. So how less bad are your homes? And not everybody is building homes with a HERS rating of 41, but that's a pretty darn good HERS rating. And I'm assuming that this group, everybody knows what a home energy rating system or HERS rating is. Uh, the HERS 100 is built to the 2006 IECC. A HERS 0 
is a zero energy home over the course of a year. And the 2012 IECC, for example, would be about a HERS 82. So a 41 by comparison would only be half as bad. It's not good, it's half as bad. So uh, with that humbling thought, some of these graphs, don't worry about trying to read the numbers on them. The numbers aren't important. What this graph showed is if you bought 30 years worth of energy for a house in 1973, that energy would cost you $8,550. In 1981, with the then current cost of energy, it would cost you almost $29,000. In 2011, when I first put this class together, it would have been $77,000. But when you project those increases forward for the next 30 years, by the time you get from 2011 to 2041, your energy bill for this, the average house would be $220,587. So uh, that's that's represented by that big red blob in the middle of the screen there. That That's a lot of moolah. Uh, and another way to look at it, this graph was uh, actual inflation or CPI inflation down at the lower, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this line down here is average CPI inflation. This curve up here is average uh, energy inflation. This red is the amount of time that energy stayed above that curve. And then it just dropped a couple of times to kind of get it back down to that curve. But uh, that, that's a lot of money. And if you're thinking about retiring and your uh, social security check is gonna stay here with CPI inflation and your energy is doing this, you're in deep trouble. So we're gonna help folks. What are we gonna do about it? Well, we're gonna design and build better homes, zero energy homes and positive energy homes, which is what we call a house that also will power a car or power your business or power other aspects of your life beside the house. So how? That's what this class is about. How do we get there from here? So in a couple of slides here, I'm gonna list the 12 steps. So it starts with building orientation simple design, window orientation, thermal mass, a tight building envelope. Most of you have heard of most of these, but balanced insulation levels is another one that you probably haven't heard a lot. And continuing on balanced ventilation, you've probably heard a lot about heat pump selection and operation, water heating choices, which are very local, efficient appliances, lighting systems. And finally, the last one, not the first, the last one is alternative energy sources. Many people want to just jump right to the, to the candy at the end and put photovoltaics on the roof. Well, let's try to get some of these other things right uh, before we jump to the end. So normally in a classroom setting, I'm asking who is in this class? And in this case, I'm assuming that you're mostly uh, builders. There might be some architects and designers in the group, I hope, possibly some developers, probably some subcontractors, HVAC professionals. Um, but whichever one of these that, you know you fit into, I think you're going to get a lot out of what we're going to do today. So chapter one, or the first step, is building orientation. This next slide is just one example of how you can find true north. If you drive a stake in the ground using a level so that you can get it exactly plumb in both directions, so it's exactly vertical, hook a tape measure on the end of the base of that stake and lead it approximately north and watch as the shadow gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And wherever you are when the shadow is the shortest before it starts getting longer again, that is exactly north, true north. Forget about compasses and all that other monkey focus that you might know that sometimes don't work, all right? Compasses can be affected by magnetic variation and lots of other factors. The sun will never lie to you about where it's true north. So here you go. Um, this is a nice little trick, by the way, when you go out to a, a customer's uh, lot and you stick a stake in the ground with a level, they get so impressed with what you know about where the sun is. So uh, easy to do, but that would be what we call your local apparent noon. It doesn't matter when noon is on the clock. It can be up to about 15 minutes off because our time zones 
as, as drawn like an orange peel are 15 degrees apart. All right, the uh, uh, 15 degrees is a lot of time. There's, there's, there's quite a bit of time between, uh, you divide the earth into 15 degrees, you got about an hour and a half per, so it's a lot of dif difference. Um, so um, this, in this graph, it just illustrates for our latitude, we're at 48 north. I think you guys are at 36 north, so not quite as far. You're, your extremes won't be quite as far as ours, but where we are, our summer sunrise and summer sunset are about 30 degrees north of true east and west. And then our sunsets and sunrises in the uh, wintertime are 19 degrees south. So there's quite a bit of difference between where the sun is gonna rise in the summer or set in the summer and where it's gonna rise and set in the winter. So understanding where that's going to happen in your location is going to help you with some of your uh, some of your building orientation. So again, this is for our 48 degree north. You can just uh, adjust these a little bit for your 36 by adding 12 degrees to the 19, and your uh, winter lowest noon sun will be at 31 degrees, and then again adding. 12 degrees up here for the difference between your uh, latitude and ours, it's going to be 77 degrees. So your sun's going to be pretty high up in the air in the summer as compared to ours. But understanding where that is, is something that every builder should know. And especially designers when you're designing your overhangs, and we'll get more into that. Um, yeah, some things that everybody should know about the earth is we have the equator going right through the center and we've got an Arctic circle. And then we have the same thing, the Antarctic circle in the South. Um, the Arctic circle starts at 67 degrees because that is the point at which when the sun is at the lowest in the winter, it's, it's gonna be dark in, in this whole area because the sun is never gonna get, when the sun is over the uh, Tropic of Cap Capricorn, to 23 degrees south of the equator, uh, none of that sun is going to make it to the Arctic Circle. So, um, so here we are. Uh, that would be like Hawaii, <laughs> be on the Tropic of Cancer, or Los Cabos, New Mexico, and we're way up here somewhere, uh, roughly halfway between the 23 degree Tropic of Cancer and the Arctic Circle, which is at 67 degrees. So sort of know where you are. The winter sun will always be 23 degrees south of the equator. The summer sun will be 23 degrees higher. So how do we capitalize on this? All right, let's assume we all are good celestial navigators, know where the sun is. But uh, there's a number of things that we can do. So orienting the building so that a long side faces south, for example, so your solar panels might face the right direction. Looking at the height of the roof and the orientation of the roof, the overhangs, so that the sun doesn't bake you out of the house in the summertime, but can still warm the house a bit when it's lower in the wintertime. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, window orientation we'll talk about in a few minutes. Landscape design and orientation is very important to help keeping a house cool, especially, and it's very climate specific. So, uh, you know, your job is to know what the climate is in your neighborhood and learn what to do about it. So, some things we try to do when we're designing for zero energy is we want to put alongside of the house south if possible. That presents a large roof area to the south for solar panels. We want the roof ridge then to be east to west, if at all possible. We want to locate rooms within the house to optimize daylighting during the hours of most activity. So for example, uh, rooms where you're going to hang out like a breakfast room. Gosh, wouldn't it be nice if the breakfast room was kind of on the southeast corner so it's nice and sunny and bright when you wake up in the morning and get that first cup of coffee. So thinking about how you move during the day where you have dinner, where you, where you sit to watch TV and whatever, make sure those locations of those rooms are as appropriate as possible to give you good daylighting and limit the amount of time that you need to have lights turned on. Um, other things are moving the building location. Whoops, just tripped here for me back up. 
Um, moving the building location within the lot to maximize or minimize solar exposure, depending on, again, your local needs. You know, you, you have a little warmer climate than we do, but we do still have some long, hot west sun coming in in the late afternoon in the summertime. So uh, looking at either man-made or, or natural uh, restrictions that could help mitigate uh, unnecessary overheating and then still provide us the solar exposure that we want. Um, within the uh, National Green Building Standard, uh, they actually recommend most of the windows or a large percentage uh, facing south and then a smaller amount facing east or west and even fewer facing north. Uh, in most climates, having more east facing is better than having more west facing because much of the year you still do want to warm the house up in the morning, whereas by the mid afternoon, it's starting to get hot. And so more west facing windows are gonna overheat you. So again, looking at which rooms need more daylighting at what time of the day and trying to organize your interiors. What you'll find is you have a very pleasant interior when you've paid attention to nature. Uh, another thing is looking really carefully at, and we'll look at this more later, but looking at furniture arrangement, how are you going to employ your furniture in a room in a way that makes sense? Uh, each window should provide more than just one function. And uh, the, the functions that we think of is letting light in and maybe you can open the window for some ventilation. We have egress. Uh, we also have to see out. And then of course the aesthetics of, of the house itself. So try to uh, make each window really work for you because those windows are big holes in the envelope. Uh, we're gonna look a little bit about how we can optimize our roof height and our orientation. Again, the largest face of the roof should face south. The eave, sh eave height should get the roof up above man-made and natural restrictions. You know, if, if that eave is up high enough, when we put our solar panels up there, they're not gonna be shadowed by the neighbor's house or by a tree or something else that's, that's an impediment. If at all possible, try to keep all your plumbing vents on the north side of the ridge line so that they're not interrupting where you wanna put solar panels. Uh, yeah, south facing dormers are another thing. If, if, if you do a one great big shed dormer say, facing south, that's fine. You can put solar panels all over it but there's nothing worse than this little sort of typical country house with three south facing dormers and no space left on the roof for anything else. Uh, you can put all the dormers you want facing north, but just don't plug up your south roof unless you have some other way to, to provide your power. And then I'm gonna show you a slide here in a minute, how to use a T-shaped roof where the main ridge can't face the right direction. So in this case, we had the main house here with a ridge running this way. And we added this covered porch area to it so that we could extend a roof out here to the west. And that gave us a south facing roof that was as big as the roof would have been uh, had it faced east. So there's lots of tricks you can do with your roof orientation to actually improve what you can do in terms of solar exposure for, for photovoltaics. And then here's a slide using that same house, kind of showing you what you can do with some trees. You put shorter trees on the south side that will provide shade for those south facing windows. But taller trees can go on the east and west sides of the house that in the early morning hours will provide some shade either here or over here. This tree would really be great over here at the uh, northwest corner. So those long afternoons at this time of year when the sun just seems to take forever to go down, you'd have some big shade back here shading, maybe some bedrooms that are back in that area. So uh, just don't shade your south facing roof. I love uh, like deciduous fruit trees, semi-dwarf fruit trees that don't get tall enough to actually shade the roof, but they provide lots of shade in the summer. And then in the wintertime, they drop all their leaves and you get lots of sunshine through them in the wintertime and you get free fruit. So semi-dwarf fruit trees are, are a great, uh, great benefit. 
Chapter two is simple design. So, you know, you've all heard the keep it simple, stupid. Um, yeah, it, it really counts. We're going to take a look at how much. And again, don't worry if you can't read the numbers. They don't matter. It's the point that matters. If you take a single story house of the same size as a two story house, what you find is that it has up to twice as, or excuse me, 25% more surface area. Now, surface area is what costs you money to build. The air inside a house is free. So keep your surface area down. In this illustration, we just took a, a, a let's see, what was the dimension? 22 and a third foot, roughly square, stack two of them on top of each other. And we got a, the total uh, thousand square feet uh, with a fairly small surface area. Here we took the two squares and we put them side by side. And again, add about 25% more surface area between the floor, the roof, all the walls. Here's an even more extreme example using the same simple box house versus making it an H shaped house like this. And, or excuse me, a U shaped house. H would be even worse. And in this place, there's a 48.5% increase in surface area. And again, that's coming out of your pocket when you're building it. Every inch of surface area you're paying for. And then the entire life of that project is losing energy out that surface. You don't lose energy out of space. You lose energy out of surface. So keep your, your design simple. I think I just covered this a minute ago. Costs you money to build, to finish, to maintain, and then even to dispose of that surface area at the end of its life cycle. So whether it's a siding product that you have to replace at some point, imagine if you only had to replace, you know, 60 or 70% as much siding. That's that much less weight, that's that much less labor. Uh, and then what is the real cost in energy? And it is a lot. Here's an example of a house that looks very plain. This is a roughly 2,000 square foot, very simple house. And, uh, you know, it looks okay, but this one was on a very narrow, tiny city lot with, you know, we could barely keep it within the, the setbacks. And then here's the same house, but out in the country lot, nice setting with lots of trees around. And we had room to put a lot of covered porches. And so we can give this house a lot of style with those covered porches, uh, where the, the heated envelope or the conditioned envelope of the house is still very square and basic. So look at how you can, you can add the glitzy stuff, add the good looks uh, on the outside of a very simple box. Chapter three is window orientation. So we, we touched on this a minute ago. The particular house you're looking at there is a Painted Hills unit of the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. Wintertime, it gets down to about uh, minus five on average at night. And yet in the daytime, it gets up to 50 degrees. So windows are very important there to be able to shade them in the summer. This is kind of a middle year picture here, but these overhangs will completely shade these windows in the summer and yet let full sun into them when the sun is lower in the sky in the wintertime. So I touched on this a minute ago, the ICC 700, which is the National Green Building Standard, uh, recommends between 10 and 7 and 10% of floor area in your south facing glass and not more than 4% for east or west facing glass. Uh, we just recently finished one uh, with 8.66% uh, of south facing, so right in the middle of that, and 3.5% uh, of east facing. And actually on that one, we had zero north or west facing glass, partly because it was a daylight basement plan. And so there was a lot of north and west that was buried, but there was no reason for windows on, on the rest of that. And uh, it, it really helped with the performance of the house. So, in most climates, we're going to lose heat overnight. We're going to want to get a little bit of that heat back in the morning. So again, the east facing glass is a nice way to let some of that in in the morning. And again, this can be a seasonal thing. So you might want to do some shading in the summertime where you are in that uh, east facing glass. But uh, let that sun get through in, in the wintertime. 
So one of the little things that most people don't really know about low E coatings, low E coatings are most effective when the, uh, when the sun is at a steeper angle. So at, at a lower angle, the energy will penetrate a lot better, whereas at a steeper angle, it will tend to deflect, deflect more. So when the sun is lower in the sky, it does have to get through more atmosphere, which will you know, dumb it down a little bit, but it's still, those windows are more vulnerable to that. Again, you can use that to your advantage, it can be either an advantage or a disadvantage, depending how you're how you're placing your windows. So very little energy is gained. It's not quite true that no energy is gained from north facing glass, but in the summertime when you're in the northern hemisphere, you're going to get a little bit of sun in those late evenings or early mornings. There isn't much heat coming through in those. But uh, uh, look at the difference between uh, energy lost overnight and all day long by having a window versus just turning on a light when you need to from time to time. So if you have closets and rooms like that that are on your north, instead of putting a window in them for natural daylighting, just, uh, that's my phone, my wife's phone, sorry about that. <laughs> it's gonna ring till she answers it, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, calculate the energy needs or the energy loss of that north facing window and decide if it's really worth it. If it's just in a closet that you're only in for a few minutes a day with LEDs, especially just turn on a light. It's, you know, lights are not a bad thing. Um, here's a, an example here of a, a light turned on for four hours a day, at 23 watts. So that's a, a fairly large LED these days. That'd be 92 watts per day. And so it costs $3.69 per year. And so when you take a 3.0 by 4.0 window, and again, looking at the, uh, the design degree day, et cetera, and multiplying all that out, it's $14 per year. So the light costs far less than the window on overall energy use. So for, for a a room that this is a, a, even a light that you're going to have on four hours a day, where most closets, it's only going to be on for 15 minutes a day or, or less. So uh, again, depending on where the room is, um, make sure you're appropriate with your use of lights versus windows. And again, on shading, don't want to beat this to death too far, but uh, pay attention to the east side for uh, late morning hours in the summertime. Uh, south facing during spring, summer, and fall. And then all west, west facing needs to have some shading because you're gonna overheat uh, if you have too much west facing glass. Let's look at some glass options. Uh, you know, we, we have, everybody's pretty much familiar with the term low E glass, but we have different, uh, different nomenclature for different amounts of low E coating. And this happens to be from cardinal glass. And again, don't worry about reading the numbers. It doesn't matter. The point is that there are choices. Uh, the 366 glass has about three times, as, excuse me, about two times as much coating on it as the 180 or the 181 or whatever you're using. That 366, 180, 270, those numbers have to do with the amount of low E coating. And so when you want more reflection of heat, you want the higher number, the 366, when you want less reflection of heat because you want to use your thermal mass and solar uh, passive solar gains, then you want to lose, use a lower, like a 179, 180, 181. And you'll see that the visual transmission is an important number as well. Uh, we want to get up above 50% visual transmission. Uh, so you can do that even in triple glazed windows with some of these good coatings. Chapter four is thermal mass. And I think it's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, you can do more at lower cost using thermal mass. And we're gonna show you a little bit of how to do that. Um, this is just a, a little spreadsheet that I put together a number of years ago that does a calculation for day to night temperature swings. 
And given the volume of the house and the amount of uh, thermal mass in it, you can calculate the number of degrees that will be lost in temperature. What you'll find is that a thermal mass slab, say a four inch thick slab, it'll hold more energy in just one degree of temperature drop than the air above it in 60 degrees. Now you heard that right, 60 degrees of temperature. You would gain that much heat in a house if you didn't have thermal mass. Whereas if you have thermal mass, the temperature would only rise by one degree with that same amount of heat. So by using heat to regulate the temperature from day to night, by using thermal mass, you can actually cut your heating loss or your, your cost of reheating by up to 44%, depending on where you are. So forget about all the fancy everything else, thermal mass, 44% savings over what you're doing today. Um, yeah, so this is one of the ways we do it. By using passive solar gains when the sun comes in that window through a low solar heat gain window, it'll warm up the slab in the morning. It'll keep that heat all day, all night. And again, with, with good window orientation, it's gonna work better. But even without good window orientation, if you have thermal mass, you can do things like using a heat pump all day to heat the house or all night to cool the house and not have to run it the other time. So in other words, imagine, look how hard it is for a heat pump to cool a house when it's 90 degrees outside. But if you could pump that cool into the house overnight when it was only 65 or 70 degrees outside, that heat pump is so much more efficient. Let it bring the temperature of the thermal mass slab or other thermal mass items in the house, which includes your framing, your sheetrock, everything that is inside the envelope. So um, we'll, we'll look at some of that a little bit more in the heat pump chapter, but you'll be amazed how much money and energy you can save with good use of thermal mass. And this is, a, uh, this is gonna be the first of several times that I in introduce you to a program called Climate Control 6. It's out of uh, uh, UCLA, it's a free download, and it takes a lot of the NOAA charts and, and puts them into graphs that are useful. This one here is just showing the, the various uh, radiation levels at different times of the year. So month by month by month, you have a different uh, number. And so direct normal radiation is the one we most often use. But uh, again, these charts are, are very useful. This one actually happens to also show your ground temperature. So if you're looking at uh, uh, ground source heat pumps or something like that, uh, these charts are very helpful in showing you what you can use where and when. Um, so yeah, how much energy we can get from the sun. That, that chart that we just looked at a minute ago shows that Se Seattle gets up to 1,892 BTUs per day per square foot of direct normal radiation in the summer. That's a lot. In the uh, winter time, we still get 340, which is only a fraction of that. But when you add it up, it is still a lot of energy that is free. So the diffuse radiation is like when it's coming through clouds and it's, it's not very direct, not very bright. And it's still averaging at least 183 BTUs per day. So how much is that? And what does that look like? Well, again, in one of the graphs of Climate Consultant 6, they kind of show it to you like this, where the red stuff up there in the middle of the day and in the middle of the summer. So it's, it's graphing seasons against time of day. Boy, we got some nice hot stuff in the middle of the summer. We got some fairly decent stuff around that. And then, boy, as we get into winter, uh, November, December, and then at the other end, January, uh, it's it's pretty cool, but uh, th this this is just one of the of the pictures that you get a look at with climate control six, and it does help you sort of plan your strategy for for thermal mass for heating and cooling and a lot of other things. This is building Montana by uh, comparison, and you you remember how small that was. In fact, we'll just back up. Look at how small that dark red was and the the bigger red around it. And Billings, look, they, they have some nice weather all year round because they're a much sunnier climate. 
And Billings is one of those places, by the way, where you can save up to 44% of your heating and cooling energy using thermal mass. Whereas in Seattle, you can only save 22%, only 22%. Let's see, I covered that one, I think. Oh, so yeah, just a little more explanation of that. Um, with the 200 square feet of south facing glass with a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.5, we would get 100 times 183. This is looking at the 183 BTUs per day uh, of diffuse radiation. So that's 18,300 BTUs on a cloudy winter day. And depending on the size and how well your house is insulated and built, but for our houses, this is actually about an hour and a half for the average uh, house that we build. An hour and a half of energy for free, just for orienting your, your glass correctly. This is without even counting the thermal mass. It's just, just orienting your glass correctly. Um, and on a sunny day, we could gain, again, if we didn't shade it, we could gain up to 34,000 BTUs. Ah, but that's the design degree day based on an outside temperature of 19 degrees. What is the outside temperature during that same cold winter month? So again, another look at, at climate consultants. It's now six. It was five when I first put this together. Here's a, here's a graph that they present you that shows uh, the average, this, this little white line in the middle is the average temperature by month. And then the extremes are shown with the green, the extreme warm, the extreme cold. And so you can see that a, a large portion of the year, and again, this is Seattle, your temperatures are not all that different from ours, really. You have a little bit more up in this 90 plus. Uh, you have a little less down in this 30 and below. But you know, by and large, your, your graph is going to look very similar to this on the surface. But what you find is there's a lot of time that your house stays between 50 and 80 or I should say that your natural temperatures stay between 50 and 80. And that's all the time that you, you won't even have to add any heat or very, very little heat if you're managing correctly with thermal mass. So again, our average temperature here is 41 degrees in January. You're probably very similar. Uh, that's only 57% of the way to the design degree day. And yet we design our heating systems to manage the design degree day. Well, most of the time, then our heating systems, even in January or our coldest month, are, are still only needing to, to draw 57% of what they're designed to draw. So uh, when you look how much of that you can get uh, on a sunny day, that again would be three and a half hours of energy, which is you know a good percentage of your 24 hours. And a cloudy day, one and three quarters, Again, it might not seem like a lot, but it sure does add up over time. Um, yeah, our average annual temperature is 52 degrees here. And again, I'm guessing it's probably pretty similar where you are, maybe a little bit warmer. But uh, again, that's only 35% of the way to the design degree day. And think about how much time you spend running a heating system when you really only need 35% of it. So part load conditions are really important. And again, for that average day, six hours of sun would provide it, it, enough heat to heat the house for nine hours on the average day. So uh, pay attention to that solar gain. Um, so in the summertime, what happens if your slab gets too hot? Can it? Yeah, in your climate, it can. If you just let all the sun come in and just start baking that slab, and you could have what we call a runaway slab, where the slab gets up to 75 and to 80. And, and if that slab does start to get up in, you know, into higher temperatures, the whole house is just going to be hot and miserable the whole time. It's not going to, you know, it's, you've got to keep the, the slab under control. And so what we do is we uh, in, in areas where that slab can overheat, uh, control the solar gains. But if you need to start bringing the slab temperature down, run the air, AC at night, let the AC cool the slab off, and then the slab will be cool all day tomorrow. Okay? 
um, let your thermal mass work for you. Um, and again, a lot of the a lot of the excess heat can be transferred into the ground um, and exhausted. Like if you have our, our average nighttime temperature in the summertime is below 60 degrees. So by running just a fan, running our kitchen fan, we'll get into this with uh, ventilation, running our kitchen fan in concert with an incoming fan, uh, without an HRV, we can cool the house considerably in the overnight hours and never have to run the AC. So keeping the thermal mass stable is kind of the one key to being successful with it, but, Remember that thermal mass needs to be completely inside the building envelope. I can't tell you how many architects have sent me a plan and said, look at this big thermal mass wall. It's concrete block, and it's, well, but it's, it's outside the building envelope, but it's contacting the building envelope. The heat is just going to run through that wall like it wasn't there. So your, your thermal mass must be completely inside the building envelope or it's wasted. Uh, add thermal mass even on a second floor by pouring a slab over your framed wood floor. We typically do that when we have a daylight basement house and then our second floor is the main floor and we wanna maintain a very continuous even temperature on that main floor. Uh, and again, orienting windows to provide direct access where it's appropriate to your thermal mass. And then using thermal mass walls or stairs, build your stairs out of concrete. That's that much more thermal mass and it connects your upstairs to your downstairs. So if, if it's cool, you're looking for that concrete's gonna stay cold. If it's hot heat you're looking for, that concrete can warm when you warm the house and it'll transfer that heat from the downstairs to the upstairs. So um, lots of ways of adding thermal mass in places that don't actually cost any extra money. Next is gonna be a tight envelope. I'm sure that everybody in, in this group understands the value of tight envelopes. Um, you know, just some, some numbers, hope I don't bore you too much with numbers, but air only contains 0 0.0183 BTUs per cubic foot per degree. That's not very darn much heat. And so if your house is a thousand square feet with an eight foot ceiling, as in that little cube house that we were drawing earlier. Um, that's 146.4 BTUs inside that house per degree of temperature difference, right? That's not very much. Uh, in our case, our design degree day is 50 degrees cooler than the 70 degrees we want. Now there's about 20 degrees. And so that takes about 7,320 BTUs to heat that house. All right, so again, at, at 0.6 ACH, I'm talking about ACH natural, not, not ACH, uh, ACH natural is gonna be a, a lot less because ACH as you test a house in a blower door test is at uh, uh, 50, uh, 50 CF, what is it, what's the number? ACH 50, anyway, it's, it's ACH 50 as opposed to ACH natural, but uh, so anyway, at, at 0.6 ACH, you would lose, which is a very average house, you would lose 4,392 BTUs per hour. That's most of the heat that's contained in that house. And in a day, that would be 105,000 BTUs. At 0.35, which is a, a fairly good house, uh, you would only lose 2,500 BTUs in an hour or 61,000 per day. At 0.1, which is about what the average house that we build, you'd lose only 17,560 degrees in a day. That's a lot different from that 105,000. So with 12% glazing, let's compare that to some conductive heating loss. With 12% glazing and a good wall assembly, the two-story little design, 1,000 square foot, we use a total of 10,866 BTU on the design degree, including the, uh, the 0.6 ACH. Again, this is the 4,300 from air infiltration alone, which is almost half the total heat loss. This is a two bedroom home. This thing jumped on me again. Uh, ASHRAE 62.2 only requires 32 and a half CFM, which would be 1,784 BTU. And so why don't we save all the rest of that? 
right? And it's, it's very easy to do, just build a tight house. And uh, again, looking at how much it saves you in a year, and it all depends on what you're, what you're heating with and what your uh, cost per therm is, et cetera, and so forth. But that's just tightening up a tiny little house. We're looking at almost $60 a year. Uh, these numbers were put together a few years ago, so your energy cost is, is probably quite a bit higher than that now. But the point is not what the specific number is. The point that there's a lot of money to be saved over time by just getting it tight. And again, uh, walls that breathe, trap pollens, mold, mildew spores, odors, steam and grease from cooking, and all other sorts of things. Whatever's in the environment, if, if that air is able to migrate through your wall, it's going to bring all that stuff into it, leave it in there like a filter. Not a good idea. So make sure your wall cavities are tight. Next, we're going to talk about balanced insulation. And, and this is one that you probably haven't heard anybody talk about before because it's, it's just not a uh, commonly discussed subject, mostly because we're so... Um, we're so vested in stick frame construction. Uh, the cost of building a wall a certain way and a certain thickness uh, starts going up really fast if you change it to make it a thicker thickness. And therefore, uh, we, we just, we're not doing it right, quite frankly. So what we look at here is if we took a 10 by 20, 10 room with a R60 insulation, all right? That's what code is gonna throw at you here the next go around, R60. But if you just took the insulation out of a one foot square area of that, so you had no insulation for one square foot, but 99 square feet at R60, what is the net R value of that whole area? When you do the, the math on it, it actually comes out to R26. So why are we putting a whole lot of insulation in one place and then nothing or near nothing somewhere else? It simply doesn't make sense. So start with any house that you have an energy model for, and we'll show you one using a, a component performance worksheet, and uh, skew your insulation levels so that you have very different levels in different areas, but so that they add up the same. So for example, if you downgrade a thousand square feet of walls from an R21 to an R11, and then upgrade the thousand square feet of roof from R38 to R49. So we're, we're changing each by about 10 Rs. And so looking at this uh, couple of next graphs, you're gonna see that this is the original where our UA target was 295 and using more of a normal uh, insulation values, uh, our pro proposed UA for this project was 236.6. Now by skewing those two, the walls and the roof, we've, we're suddenly up to 274. Remember that was 236. That's a considerable jump just by having disparate levels of insulation. So the, the point is the more closely you get those insulation levels aligned, the better your overall performance is given the same amount of insulation. And just before we get to this slide, I'm just gonna explain the reason why we tend to put more and more and more insulation in an attic and don't make our walls thicker is because it's so much more expensive to make walls thicker with the way we're building walls. There's all those studs that everyone has to go from a two by four to a two by six, and then from a two by six to a two by eight. That's a lot more lumber. And it's not just the lumber and the walls, it's every window that we have to line with a nice wood trim, every door we install with a nice wood trim, that wood adds up a lot more, a lot faster. Whereas our roof, we don't change much, maybe a raised heel truss or a thicker SIPS if we're using a SIPS roof. There's one trim board around the perimeter. So the amount of stuff you have to do to put more insulation in a roof the cost of putting more insulation in the roof is much less. But if you could build in a way that your roofs and your walls cost about the same per square foot, and you could insulate them the same, that would give you a much better envelope, okay? So 
uh, leaving that aside for a minute, we'll go on to the next slide because I don't have time to get too deep into everything. Um, if you think about how we install windows, we're removing 12 square feet of our 21 wall for a three foot by four foot window. And we're replacing it with a roughly R3 window, okay? And what do you suppose just happened to the net R value of that R21 wall? Do that about 10 times. And what happens, that's for 10 windows in a house, our little cube house designed, increased its BTU by 21%. If you went with a U.21 window, which is a triple glazed, or there are actually double glazed, double OE uh, with Krypton, very, very good double glazed windows that can get you down in that range, but it's only a 14.6% increase. So what do you want? 21% worth of windows or do you want 14%? That's how we need to be building better houses with better windows. Take the place that's the weakest place and plug that weak hole. Windows is a great place at very little cost to go from an R3 up to an R7. So if we can save a third of the energy loss by using better windows, what it means is we could also add 33% windows and have the same total energy loss. So either side of the fence you want to be on, if you wanna say, I want more light, I want more view, I want more glass in my house, just use better glass and you can do it. We're using windows right now that have a U value at center of glass down around 0 0.12, 0 0.13. They're a triple E, triple low glaze, tri excuse me, triple, triple low E, triple glazed window with argon. And again, they're, they're cost effective. And yes, they cost double what the window you're buying is. But when you look at what else can I do in the house to save that much energy, especially in a house that has a lot of glass, it's a cheap solution. Again, each, each uh, house needs those questions asked and answered specifically, because every house is a little different, the orientation is different, et cetera. Um, the summary on, on balanced uh, insulation levels is that heat goes to cold. Okay, we, we always think of, of um, heat rising, it's actually warm air that rises, not heat, and so, we tend to put more insulation in the roof, less in the walls, again, because it's cheaper to do so, not because it's necessarily needed there. So getting the insulation levels as balanced as you can, you're never going to have them all the same. You're never going to get an R21 window, R21 wall, R21 roof. But if you could, it would actually outperform what we're building today, even the best of what we're building today. And Let's see, so the closer all the insulation levels can get to each other, the better it will perform. And just look at, at other ways of adding more wall insulation, again, to help out even, help even those levels. Um, using the best windows and doors you can find does make sense. And again, weigh every one against the cost of providing renewable energy. So when you look at what's, what's your cost to upgrade your windows, and how much energy does it save you versus the next couple of solar panels? What does it cost to add more solar panels on the roof to make the difference in what you're losing with your windows? And what you find is the windows typically become more cost effective than the solar panels. Let's see how we're doing for time. Yeah, I think we're doing okay. Um, or no, we're not doing okay. We're, we're running behind. Sorry about that. Um, okay, balanced ventilation. Um, tight houses will not allow air to come in through the cavities. So exhaust only ventilation is not gonna work well, especially for large loads like, like your range fan. Uh, cost of operation will also be lower when balanced ventilation strategies are used. So we're gonna show you in a, in a minute uh, some graphs on this, but again, commercial kitchens have been required to have a class A hood system, which or class one hood system, which has the same amount of air coming in as going out. You need to do that in tight homes 
And we're gonna look at a graph here again, don't worry about seeing the actual numbers, but you can see that the performance just drops like a rock as the pressure differential goes. So um, you're just not moving as much air and you're using more energy to move it, which you can see in this table here as, as that pressure, uh, pressure differential changes. You're trying to suck air out of a house that you just can't do it. So by, by putting a fan pushing air in at the same rate you're pushing air out, what you end up with is you're, you're using half the energy to move twice the air. That's a four time gain for having two fans helping each other. So again, filtering our air is important also. So with a fan bringing air into the house, let's put some filters in front of it. You can either use an inline filter like this, or you can use a HEPA filter like this, which this is a powered HEPA filter that we use and we balance the range fan with it. We move more air at lower cost. Um, and here's a little schematic of how you run the two fans. This one is using the fil HEPA filter to balance two bath fans and the speed control runs both of them. We can also put timers on that to bring overnight air into the house when, when you don't even have to think about it all night long, or we can put a, a cooling thermostat whenever the temperature gets down to a certain temperature, it'll turn that fan on and just let it run those two fans to, to cool the house overnight. When the outside temperature goes above 70, it'll shut off and uh, you're good to go for the next day. HRVs and ERVs, again, it's climate specific. You guys are probably using ERVs where you are. Uh, the difference is that the ERV is capturing moisture content and either maintaining it in the house or kip it, kicking it out of the house. Uh, the heat recovery ventilator just captures what they call the sensible heat. And again, this is just a quick uh, diagram of, of a cross flow uh, heat recovery ventilator. They tend to be around 60% efficient. The counter flows like the Zender here, they have more of a linear uh, connection between the incoming and the outgoing. And so it transfers a lot more energy. They'll be around 95% efficient. And again, this is another one of my little spreadsheets that figures out, is it cost effective? And what I find is in many climates that uh, it doesn't matter which uh, uh, ERV or HRV you're using, it'll be very cost effective in climates that have very hot summers and very cold winters. It will not be cost effective in climates where you have a more moderate climate throughout the year. So you do have to do the math on this. You can see the difference is $81 over here per year, and $771 over there. I like to keep my money. So there's, again, this is a case where uh, this costs more than this in the uh, Western Washington area. Uh, and then something that I think is very important to you guys, I, I hope you have explored doing earth tubes. Um, it is very uh, location and climate specific. It doesn't work in every house, but we have uh, some very successful earth tube systems where we're actually bringing air in around the perimeter of the house from up to four or five different places and actually it, it enters the actual house near the center of the house. All of these pipes slope back to the outside so that when we collect moisture, which all summer long, those 90, 90 days, what happens when you take that 90 degree, very moist air and put it into 60 degree earth? It's gonna drain the water right out of it and it's gonna flow right back outside and you're gonna be bringing dry air into your house. So even aside from the energy saving feature of being able to bring fresh air into the house at 60, 65 degrees, instead of bringing 90 degrees air into the house and having to cool it again or running it through an HRV, in this case, the earth does it for you. And I put this underneath the house. And on days where it was 20 degrees outside here in the Puget Sound area, we're getting 68 degrees into the house. So amazing stuff. Uh, it's the next thing I need to develop a class on. Uh, some other ways is opening windows on opposite side of the house, have a high one to let the warm air exhaust. 
a low window on the opposite side to let cool air come in. So many different uh, strategies that don't require a lot of energy to help ventilate a house. And so remember, always balance your large ventilation loads, especially in smaller and tighter homes. Uh, small venting loads can be exhaust only because even you know just a bath fan is typically only on for a little while at a time, and then it's off again. It'll find enough air by itself, okay. But it's those large loads like a range fan that need to be balanced. And then consider the appropriate filtration for all incoming air, especially out here in the West with all the forest fires. Those HEPA filters are absolutely amazing at keeping the indoor air quality good inside a home, even in the worst of conditions outside. And then try to allow some automatic uh, operation so your homeowner doesn't have to mess with a lot of fancy stuff, uh, but allow some user adjustment and keep it simple. Chapter eight is heat pumps and uh, uh, you know, if, if you're not already using heat pumps on 100% of your homes, you should be. Um, I, I'm going to go over some real quick math on why you should be. But uh, once we've used all the gas, it's gone. Uh, when gas is burned, it contributes directly to climate change. Uh, that's not even counting all the gas that is, that is lost in the atmosphere in the process of, of uh, getting it out of the ground and getting it refined, and getting it to where it goes. That, that stuff has been just devastating for us. Uh, whereas a heat pump only moves heat from one place to another. It does not create heat. They have lower maintenance costs and higher ultimate efficiency. So if you just look at the efficiency factor, modern gas plants are about 63% efficient at producing electricity delivered to the grid. They could be located right in the middle of town. So very low line losses. And when you operate a heat pump in connection with that, the average heat pump right now is about 240% efficient times 0.63, you're 151% efficiency with your use of the gas. All right. And that only requires an HSPF or heating season performance factor of 8.2. Most of ours are 10.1 or better. In fact, to be energy star, you're at, at, at 10 or better. And so that's 300% efficient, which then becomes 189% efficient with your use of gas. So if you're still burning gas in the house for anything, you're doing it wrong. I've been saying this for 15 years, it's time to pay attention. Ground source heat pumps can be up to 450% efficient. That'd be 283.5% efficient with their use of gas, even when you're using gas to make the electricity. Right, if you're using photovoltaics or wind or other sources, all these arguments just, I mean, why would you even think about using gas? It makes no sense when you can use all these other sources of energy to run a heat pump. And we have air source heat pumps that are good down to minus 15 Fahrenheit. I'm using heat pumps for some zero energy houses up in Northern British Columbia at 56 degrees north, all right? And they get 40 below temperatures, but with the thermal mass and it warms up a lot during the day where they can run those heat pumps during the day, get the, the thermal mass and the slabs up to temp and they're happy. Again, just a quick look at, this is the uh, graph of temperatures in Billing, Montana. And uh, in, in a climate like this, where it spends a lot of time down in some of these very low temperatures, again, with thermal mass, and you can run down to minus 15 degrees, you can run a, a heat pump just fine in that climate. Um, and, and this just did the math on this slide. I'm gonna to try to fly through things here and, and get you home on time. Uh, we won't be on time, but we'll be close. This just does the math to show why you get a 44% savings when you use the heat pump only at night for heating or excuse me, only at night for cooling and only during the day for heating, which you can do when you have the right thermal mass. This is a chart again out of Climate Consultant 6 that shows uh, surface ground temperatures are yellow, uh, two meters down are the light green, and then four meters down are the dark green. And you can see that 
that deeper temperature, again, this is Billings, Montana, they have very cold temperatures, but that, that ground down deep enough is below 60 degrees. And even just down at six feet, it's about 64 degrees. In the winter time, that near surface temperature gets down in the mid twenties. That's too cold to use a ground source heat pump with, but by the time you get down in, into these deeper ranges, it's gonna work just fine. So again, make sure you, if you're using ground source heat pumps, make sure you're using somebody who's really qualified so they know how to do the math. Um, Well, let's see, yeah, this just overstresses that same point. But again, in, in Billings, in many places in the Northeast, what's called a deep bore system. So instead of a horizontal ground source heat pump system that is buried at about six feet below the ground, a deep bore will get down into much warmer soil temperatures and then operate at a much, uh, much lower cost, much higher efficiency. Um, some of the limitations we mentioned already on air source heat pumps is the hard limits of the uh, refrigerators we have now tend to run about minus 15 degrees. Uh, they have reduced capacity at the lower end of that range, so you have to size properly. Um, and you, you may have to have a backup system in really super cold areas. Um, the inverter-based systems, uh, again, are, are mini splits and some newer uh, whole house uh, designs are now operating using DC motors, which means they can start slow and ramp up. So oversizing a heat pump that is on DC is not a bad thing to do, whereas the traditional uh, heat pump would just come on with a bang at full power and then turn off when it needed to. It had to short cycle because it couldn't run at a part load condition. The, uh, the DC based motors, variable speed motors, they can operate very well at part load conditions. And so that's what you want to be looking for when you're selecting heat pumps. You want a variable speed motor. Uh, it's a little demonstration you can do for yourself. Put your hand against your mouth and just puff softly. And you feel how warm that is. That's 98.6 degree air. Now move your hand away and blow hard. That's still 98.6 degree air but it felt cold because it was moving. So if you're using air to heat, you're gonna feel cold, all right? So that might not be as important to you as feeling cool when you're trying to air condition. You have a much bigger air conditioning load, so you can cool very easily by moving warm air, but it is much more difficult to heat by moving warm air. So factor that into your, into your heating plan. Again, I use radiant heat almost everywhere uh, in this climate and many others, but in, in climates that are dominated by cooling, a ducted uh, forced air system can, can make some sense. Um, yeah, instead of eliminating heat pumps in very cold climates in favor of, of a gas furnace, just augment them. If you have to have some augmentation, it can often be done with just a gas fireplace or something that is pleasant to have in the house, but not used all the time. You'll save so much money with a good heat pump and just a little gas to augment it instead of doing the whole thing with gas. Again, I mentioned the inverter-based heat pumps and um, yeah, heat with heat, cool with air. So water heating is a very uh, climate uh, specific issue. Uh, in most places, you can uh, you have a variety of, of options, but it's usually the largest energy use after space, con space conditioning in most homes. And uh, it can be the largest energy use when you put the right measures into how you build the building envelope. So most of our homes, water heating is actually a, a bigger load than home heating. And water heating loads can be cut by as much as 90%. Uh, some common options, of course, we have the tank type. The electric is by definition 100% efficient. Uh, it's only 63% efficient if you're using gas to create the electricity. 
Fossil fuels are up to 95% efficient for condensing units. Your on-demand units, again, the electrics are gonna be the same, but with no storage. Fossil fuels up to 98% efficient, uh, but no storage. Heat pump water heaters, on the other hand, are up to 335% efficient, which means 211% net unit efficiency using gas. So, you know, as if you're producing your gas with, or excuse me, producing your electricity with gas, you're 211% efficient uh, based on that uh, heat pump water heater. Uh, the superheaters on uh, uh, ground source heat pumps, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it because we're running out of time, but uh, there's a better way. Uh, just prioritize the ground source heat pump to heat your, uh, your domestic hot water. And these are two uh, diagrams of how to do it. And then the home heating is actually a secondary function off that ground source heat pump, and you'll save a lot of money doing the system that way. Um, Let's see, this is just the math on what we talked about. Oh, and then solar hot water heaters. Again, you only use a tiny bit of electricity to run the pumps. Uh, during cold and rainy weather, even the evacuated tube systems might not fully heat the water, but used in combination with other sources, you can preheat the water to 80 degrees or so and only have to finish that off with your heat pump water heater or whatever other source you're using. And again, the solar hot waters do match up very well with ground source heat pumps and air to water heat pumps to finish that job. Um, the different types of, of systems I won't get too much into, but uh, I really like the drain back systems. This is a, a picture of one uh, where the water all flows back into the uh, buffer tank here during the overnight hours so that you don't have to ever, when, when the system's not actively working, uh, it, it doesn't have any water outside the building envelope. Um, yeah, I'll just touch on this briefly. In our climate here, a tank type water heater inside the building envelope is not a bad thing. There's been, the, the, the gas industry has tried to sell uh, gas water heaters where you know they're trying to sell the on-demand water heater because they they lock you into using gas and in many places they've even outlawed the tank type electric water heater and um, it, it's it's been a basically a, a advertising campaign by the gas industry to sell more gas uh, but in our climate uh, the tank type water heaters just helping warm the house. And in our, our climate, that's what we want. We don't have any cooling degree days. We only have heating degree days. So uh, a little bit of residual heat from the water heater is not a bad thing. Um, and again, the, the heat pump water heater, uh, if you can put it in the garage is great. If you put it in the house, if you can draw outside air to uh, heat the water and then let it exhaust into the house. It'll actually help cool the house for you. So there's a lot of advantages in the in a cooling climate like you have to have the heat pump water heater inside the house. But the tier three units uh, will be drawing outside air to actually extract the heat from. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to beat the uh, on-demand units, but really the only place on-demand units are actually more efficient than tank units is in vacation homes or other places where you're not using hot water every day. So they, they do make a decent backup source for a solar hot water heater or for a, uh, a heat pump water heater in very, very cold climates. So again, summarizing water heating, it's very climate specific. Do your homework uh, in moderate or cold climates. Uh, the residual heat is not a bad thing. It, it does help uh, heat the overall house and, and reduce the space heating needs. And finally, chapter 10, um, I'm going to try to fly through this one as well. Efficient appliances. Um, cooking will be your largest uh, remaining load after you're heating in your hot water. Clothes dryers can also be a fairly large load. And then refrigerators and dishwashers. Um, so look for the, the biggest load and try to cut that first. 
you can save more by going from a, a, a regular range to an induction range. Uh, you'll save more on that than you can do with all the other things you can do with appliances. So if you were only going to do one thing for appliances, go with an induction range. And it's amazing how well they heat and how quickly they heat up, how, how good the control is. They're way better than gas ranges. I was a gas range guy for years. I now own two induction home induction ranges, one in my home, one in my vacation home. I wouldn't have anything else. Uh, condensing dryers are coming along. They're, they're not quite there yet. They're, they're a little slow, but the principle is really great. Just like a heat pump, they recover the heat and use it again and again, wringing the moisture out of it with a condenser. So get the big loads first. Always look at not just the dollars per year, because there's a date on these and they could come from different years. Look at the kilowatt hours. And this is a, an example of two refrigerators that are identical in every way I could look at, except that one used $8 less energy than the other. And the next was our graph of, okay, what does that mean over time? And by the time you figure the inflation on energy over time, uh, we were saving uh, a lot of money. $295 that we saved in uh, 20 years and $638 in 30 years by choosing the right refrigerator. Again, the one at 50 bucks instead of 50 bu 58 bucks. Um, so the summary, you know, again, like everything, look for the big numbers and try to chop them down first and then just keep going from there. Uh, efficient lighting, I, I think the world has already gone there. Uh, I'd be surprised if any of you have put a, an incandescent light in the house for a long time. But remember when you're designing your lighting, you're lighting surfaces. You're not lighting rooms. You're not lighting the air. You're lighting surfaces. So it's either a desk surface, it's a counter surface. You're lighting the floor so you can see your way to walk across the, the, uh, the floor and not trip on something. So think about where these surfaces are, and what, how much light you need on that surface. You, you need a lot less light on a floor, for example, than you do on a countertop or a desk. And then if you can design systems, so instead of having 12 systems in a room, maybe you have one for task lighting that's nice and bright, but you can have a dimmer on it so you can turn it down and, and get your general room illumination and, or else have an ambience lighting system that can be used for general room illumination and have a separate task lighting. So fewer systems means fewer lights to be left on when they're not being used. Try to keep it simple. Um, again, dimmers, controls. Uh, with LEDs, everything has gotten so easy. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on it. But if you're using anything other than LEDs in your homes, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, again, I doubt if any of you are. And again, here's one of these graphs looking at inflation over time. This is for that 23 watt light bulb left on four hours a day. And what does it cost over time? Again, the exact numbers don't matter. It's a lot of money. And uh, if you don't already know this, 2700 Kelvin temperature. Kelvin temperature is based on the color molten steel is when they're refining steel. So uh, the higher the number, the more towards blue it is. Uh, so you get up around the 4,000, 5,000, it starts to get into a very bluey to green light. The 2,700 is a nice, warm, friendly glow in the, in the yellow range. So that's, that's the, the temperature that most people like. Uh, in the 3,000 to 4,000, 3,500 range tends to be a little bit more like daylight. And so if you're trying to really light up a shop area or something like that, so it's like daylight inside your shop, you might want to look at, you know, 3,500, even 4,000 temperature, but uh, the 27 is what people tend to like in their homes. Um, you know, this last comment about just do it, they never need to know is about clients that we've had say, oh, no, we don't want any of that stuff. Just put it in. They won't even know. They'll just know they've got great light if you've got the right, and again, the right number of lumens. We tend to think of, of watts because we've been buying the same light bulb for a hundred years, uh, but this is the approximate lumen uh, equivalent. So a 75 watt bulb was about 1100 lumens. So when you go buying your LEDs, look for the appropriate number of lumens. A uh, hundred watt uh, incandescent is about 1600 lumens and the 60 watt was about 800 lumens. 
So buy your LEDs by the lemons. Uh, again, plug loads, um, a recent house we did here, I'm gonna show it up here in a second. The plug loads were the biggest load. Take a look at this recent uh, HERS rating. And over here, our heating was $63 a year. Our hot water, $52 a year. Lighting and appliance, $241 a year. Service charges, $84 a year. The service charges are more than the heating and almost as much as the heating and the hot water combined, but those appliance loads, lighting and appliances, that's the big bugaboo. So finally summarizing lighting, uh, light surfaces, not rooms, use LEDs everywhere you can dimmable where you can, educate your customers about the need to keep using the LEDs, not change them out for something else, and learn to select your bulbs by the number of lumens, not the number of watts they consume. And finally, we get to alternative energy. So there's some of the design tools, we've mentioned the Climate Consultant 6, that gives you lots of, gla uh, lots of graphs. It shows you what time of year you get sun, uh, it helps you uh, determine your ideal roof pitch. Another really good one is a, uh, uh, it's from the National Renewable Energy Lab. It's called PV Watts. And uh, these are available on iPhone apps so that you can estimate the annual production that you'll get out of a uh, solar panel at that roof pitch, aiming that direction and that location. So. Uh, again, Climate Consultant 6, this is one of the graphs we showed you a few minutes ago about Billings, Montana and how much, how much uh, sun they get. And these can be used in, in helping understand how much energy you're going to produce. And again, Seattle, yeah, not as good, but it's still very cost effective to do uh, solar photovoltaics here. Uh, you really need a HERS rating. You need a rating to provide that annual estimate of what your power usage is gonna be. Now, if you've built the same house over and over, then you might have a good idea of what its power use is going to be. And so you can just say, this one needs a 6KW system, or it needs a 7KW, or what it, or we're gonna, we're also gonna heat, uh, power up a car with it. So you need about another two and a half KW to power your car. So um, once you've done the same thing over and over, then maybe you don't need the HERS rating, but it's really a good way to, to know before you go uh, how much power you actually need to power up. And so it's not just trial and error. Um, again, the REM rate report that the HERS rater is going to put out is going to look something like this, or like the one we looked at a minute ago. It's going to show you where those loads are, and it shows you how much is the service charges. And so you you don't have to put the service charges back. That's just money. It's the energy that you want to put back. So match, match your, uh, your needs to the actual, uh, to what you're going to produce. And uh, I had to revise this sheet because when they advertised the Model 3, they said it'd get 3.33 miles per kilowatt hours. I can tell you that mine is getting 4.5 miles per kilowatt hour. And uh, if you think about a surplus of 3,000 kilowatt hours per year, that would power a car like that for 13,500 miles. All right, comparing that to the gas car, uh, if I'm using my photovoltaics to power this car versus my previous car, the photovoltaics are now worth 50.2 cents per kilowatt hour. You average that out with the savings for the house, and in my case, my house, I'm only paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour, but look at the value of energy when you average it all out, the house and the car, my photovoltaics are worth 23 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And that is in addition to any state or federal incentives, tax credits, anything like that. When you add the 30% tax credit to that, it starts looking pretty good. Now, I know it's only 26% now, but anyway, it looks pretty good anyway. Um, let's see, I lost that one. Um, yeah, when you're looking at uh, wind power versus solar, you really need to be out in the middle of a farm. 
Uh, renewable energy sources are very local. Consult with your local installer, use their expertise. Uh, they're, you know, they really do know what they're doing. Um, how much does it cost to get to net zero? This was taking a, a cost and saying, what are the additional costs that we did with our uh, better insulation in the foundation? We use SIPs, walls, and roofs. And uh, we saved a bit of air sealing labor because we were using the SIPs, walls, and roof. Uh, this was an uh, air to water heat pump that cost a little bit more. Uh, the HEPA filter system cost about another thousand over just a standard ventilation system. Uh, the unit chiller provided our hot water, um, but we had to buy tank coils and other things. Uh, and then the PV system, this was about five years ago. So PV was a lot more expensive at that time, uh, but our total added cost, less tax credits was about 45,000. And this is the graph on their energy savings. And you can see that actually at three years and 11 months, we broke even on it. And at uh, seven years and six months had recovered everything that they spent doing uh, the energy efficiency. And all of this green is cash savings that they're experiencing now. This house actually, now I think about it, was built in 2011. So it's already had 10 years. It's out in here somewhere. Look at all that green versus these tiny little gray areas. That's the initial cash outlay. And I mean, these, these people are, are happy, happy. And uh, actually they, they did sell that house about a year ago uh, for more than double what it cost them to build it. So uh, building zero energy is quite profitable. Uh, it is why I drive a paid for te Tesla and I have a vacation home in Hawaii. Are there any questions? That's pretty impressive. Life is good. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, uh, my chat went away when I, I took over the screen. So I'm gonna give the screen back and hopefully I'll be able to see the chat. Now, it looks like we've had one question um, from Kurt. He was asking about what brand and series of triple glaze windows are you using? So um, in the interest of full disclosure, I do have to say that I am the US rep for Vinyl Tech Windows. And that came about simply because I was specifying them for every house that I design and build. Uh, but Vinyl Tech Windows, they're out of Delta, British Columbia, and we've shipped them all over America. So uh, they're, they're a good product. There are a couple of other Canadian manufacturers that are making a very similar product. There is one U.S. manufacturer making a similar prod product, and that is Alpen Windows out of Colorado. They make a fiberglass window, however, which is a lot more expensive than the uh, vinyl windows that come out of Vinyl Tech. Does anybody else have any questions for Ted? All right. Well, Ted, I know that was a, a lot of information. Thank you for being with us this afternoon and breezing through that really quickly. Um, we've got this recorded, and what I'll do is send a note out to everyone that joined us today with a link to the recording. Um, and if it's all right with you, to share your email. So once they go back and digest all of this information. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. We, that would be Happy great. To answer any and all questions. Wonderful. Hey, Ted, well, just wanted to say thank you for your time today. I appreciate your presentation. Well, thank you for inviting me. And yeah, I, I just enjoy sharing what I know. And uh, the, the more of you that get on board, the better it will be for all of us.